damn fool. Hello and welcome to Sons of the Dragon, the Immortal Ikers podcast. My name is Connor McKenna. And I'm Carl Stout. And today we're here to cover Power Man and Iron Fist issue 70, which is the last issue in the first epic collection. So, you've gotten there somewhere. <laughs> um, but before we do that, uh, because I will forget if I don't do this now, we have a patron to reward. So, uh, we have a helpful Harlemite who signed up. And so his reward is we get a shout out and show it every month, and that's Ray. And we all know Ray uh, from Into the Night and Last Sons of Krypton. Thanks very much, Ray. Uh, as as we've said, it's really really nice of you to help out, and uh, every every dollar helps, guys. Because I'm still Michaelis, I'm still broke, so you know you get rewards and stuff. There's cool stuff there, so you should. You can get artwork and stuff, so you should go look at the Patreon um, so we can improve the show as well, because Podcast Garden sucks, and I'm <laughs> trying to sort out an issue with Podcast Garden, and as usual, it is just taking forever, so I'd love to upgrade to Libsyn as well, but it's just too expensive, so... But uh, anyway, yeah, so thanks again, Ray. Um, Thank you, Ray. Yeah, and I guess... Uh, that that's it on the Patreon front for now. Um, but we do have this issue to talk about. So, this was published uh, June 1981. The cover artist is Frank Miller. Uh, the writer is Mary Jo Duffy. Kerry Gamble is the penciler. Ricardo Villamonte and friends are the inkers. Jim Novak is letterer, Ben Sean is a colorist, Dennis O'Neill is the editor, and Jim Shooter is the editor in chief. I don't know, I'll just say whatever that is. Um, so, yeah, uh, Powerman and Ifers go to a vacation paradise. No kidding. A paradise. So, was that like a joke? Because I don't get it. <laughs> well, they're out of New York, but I don't know if I would consider Florida. <laughs> Paradise. It's definitely a vacation spot. It's not like they're in the Caribbean or anything. Well, I know about Florida is all the the uh, palm trees, the ridiculous heat, and old people love to live there. So, Disney, buddy, Disney. What about Disney? It's in Florida. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, okay. See, I'm Disney. Um, Universal Studios. Two huge theme parks down there. Of course, oh. there's a Sea World. Right. Miami, well. Florida is a mecca of a vacation spot. I've been there five different times. Wow. Spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars there. Mm. So uh, this cover we have. Uh, it's really yellow. Yeah, there's like a full-on yellow background, which is a bit odd. And we have a shirtless Luke. Well, pretty much shirtless. His shirt's torn. Shocker. And he's fighting a bunch of uh, what look like National Security Guard goons. And Danny is at the front in the water about to punch what looks like a dictator in his face with his iron fist. Uh, so. Watch for the jolt on page 11. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't Which I had I had to actually look up online because I was reading it in the Epic Collection, and since there's no advertisements, the pages are no longer in that order to find out what they were considering the jolt. I think the like the jolt, yeah, I don't know. I I didn't see a jolt either, but we'll get it's to that. The full page thing that's the recap. On okay, so I thought that mail. might have been it, but why was that like advertised on the front of? I have of no the... idea. <laughs> No idea whatsoever. Full page flashbacks aren't like uncommon, so if but, anything I found the page twelve a little more jolting to the storyline than the recap on page eleven. Maybe Kerry Gamble was just really proud of their artwork and they're like, Hey, put this on the front cover. But uh Maybe Frank Miller's artwork, they're just like, you know what? Something just needs to be in this 
open water scene. There's nothing here. Yeah, so I don't mind the characters and stuff on the cover, but that background is super lacking. And it was like that with another cover he did as well. In fact, was it the last issue? I think the last two issues he's done the covers, and they've all had this weird lack of background. I mean, I... I've run as Daredevil run a few times, and I remember there was a cover where Daredevil was holding up a gun and had a white mm-hmm. background, but nothing sticks out of my head if any of the covers in that run had backgrounds like this. But they might have, but I might just not have noticed because I did do a podcast on that run and take time to talk about the cover. So, uh, but whatever, I don't think it's his worst one that he's done because the stuff besides the background is good. I think uh, Danny's drawn, you know, fine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's nothing to write home about. Uh, (laughs) So we'll just move on uh, into the issue itself, which... uh, The shark fin bar. Yeah, so this is a cool opening page. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's different. It's a, it's a good opening page. It's like, hey, I'll probably like. I mean, this is this is the third time I've read this, mm-hmm. but it's a nice opening page because it's like, oh, hey, this is something different. This is something. I, I don't know. Like, I just like this speaks to me. A dive bar, an imminent bar fight. Like, I like the shark spin bar is, like, the name. The Charles you know. Manson in the background creeping by the jukebox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, of course, you know, we have Danny in a different outfit. Oh, it's different, all right. Uh, I think it's, it's stylish. Saturday, it's Saturday Night Live John Travolta different. Yeah, I like it, actually. I think, I think like, because Danny's worn some really bad outfits. Uh, bad is in like terrible, not not the good bad. Um, but I think this one's pretty good, and it suits him. Like he has money to spend, right? Oh yeah. So why doesn't he rock like these stylish Saturday Night Live outfits um, while drinking a Coca Cola at a dive bar? Yeah, and no one seems to like him, and he's about to get glass in the back of the head. Well, some guy's about to try and do that anyway. Now, and I then, do have to give the artist credit here. Yeah? Look at the detail in everything in this bar. And I mean everything. There's I know. on yeah. the counter. There's bolts holding the table down in the back. The detail that this artist went into on the inside of this bar, even on the next page... On the very next page, there's a half-page scene. It's got, like, 17 freaking people in it. Yeah, and no. And they're all detailed. It's it's good. It's a great opening page. The next page is good, too. And this is, like, the usual artist for the run as well. No, um, I'm not going to lie. The art does tend to get a whole lot looser towards the end of the issue more than likely because he spent so much time on these first five pages. Yeah. Yeah. But the amount of detail that this, on uh, page four, the outside scene of the, across the street from the bar, I mean, you got shingles on roofs, you've got bricks and walls, it's, it's, this guy went all out. Yeah. And plus, Um, anytime anyone attacks somebody with a full swordfish, yeah. You, you get with bonus points. That was great. I did love that. Uh, well, Kerry, Kerry Gamble's art is like consistently pretty good uh, in this run. And I also think these pages are probably the reason why the inker is listed as Richard Velamonte and Friends, because the inker had so much crap he had the ink, he had to bring in Friends. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never going to finish this book on time. My only problem is, like, uh... Let's just, sorry, I just saw what I thought was a spider that's an ant, so... Safe for now. Anyway... Right. Um, In Australia, all the bugs can kill you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Every, everything's poisonous. So, 
my only problem is like all these faces. Does everyone like look like a Neanderthal to you? <laughs> well, dude, it's a dive bar with rough and tumbles. So yeah, but even Danny looks like one. No, he doesn't. I think he does. This is where we need Rebecca for the third opinion yeah. because if it's just us two, totally looks like Mark Hamill from Return of the Jedi. Uh, I can kind of see it, but uh, in the lower face, sure. But the difference is, Mark Hamill in Return of the Jedi didn't look like a Neanderthal, but Danny around here does. So, I don't uh, think so. Plus, he has a However, bigger right, head. I do think on page two, on that full body shot of him in that white suit, he could ride a horse standing straight up with that leg spacing. Yeah, I mean, they call it a horse stance for a reason, right? So, um, but, uh, yeah, so he's about to get glass in the head, he dodges it, and he throws his coke in the dude's eye, and then we get a bar fight. Uh, oh, and they're all trying to kill him as well. The bartender's like, when you're done with him, dump his body off the pier. Like, <laughs> so, because he's just walked in and he's just been asking, hey guys, how about those drugs? Oh, and, you know, um, well, we don't, we don't know what he says, but, uh, I'm quoting here, but the well-dressed stranger hadn't even been waited on before he began asking questions about the substances the customers were inhaling and smoking and mentioning the police. So obviously that would get you shanked. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if Danny's that good at like investigating like this anyway. This seems like more Luke should be doing it, but they kind of have like a big plan here. Kind of convoluted. Maybe Luke should have just gone in and asked people, but whatever. Um, but yeah, uh, cool fight. You know, we get the classic people smashing chairs onto each other, and we just get Danny laying waste to everyone, essentially, and they're all tripping over each other. Someone throws a net on him, yep. which is awesome. Because since it's a seaside bar, there, of course, was a net as a decoration on the wall. And I love how they, like, it's a little thing, but it adds so much. The fact that, oh, this is a, this spa has, like, a nautical theme. So let's put, like, swordfish and nets in the bar fight, you know? Like, it's not just a standard bar fight. They actually use these little details to make it more interesting. Mm-hmm. Um... And, uh, you know, yeah, the, the swordfish is great. But, you know, people are just getting smacked around, sidekicked, a little leaping, like, Danny's going crazy. He has no problem with all these people. Um, he well, said, it even mentions that, you know, they're, most of these guys are three sheets to the wind. Yeah, Anyways. and he's badly outnumbered as well. But um, if they were sober, he might have a bit more trouble. But So we have this guy. What's his name again? Howard or something. Something like that, yeah. This, we don't know his name yet. We well, we get the first ready. time he runs away. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Soda in the Face guy is just like, I better get out of here before he remembers who started this mess. Yeah. His, uh, he he's scared of his outside. boss. But he's more scared of his boss than he's scared of Danny. Um, and, and waiting outside is Magnum P.I. Oh yeah. This is a great um a great oh, page. He should have worn that shirt the whole issue. This is that is my complaint. Is because we've talked about this before, but I guess it's technically a superhero costume, but when Luke changes out of clothes to put on his other clothes mm-hmm. but it doesn't make much sense. Like it's the thing is it's it's well, I guess it's the 80s now, but this is like a superhero comic, so everyone has to have a superhero costume. And Luke Cage happens to be his shirt. But, like, if this was written today, there's no way Luke would change out of that shirt to put on his other shirt. Right. Especially if he was trying to tail a guy without being spotted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like... So anyways, Luke, Luke Cage is waiting outside across the street from the bar. He hears Danny having some fun inside. Yeah. And uh, he's wearing a full-on Hawaiian shirt and what looks like some Magnum-style aviator sunglasses. Just yeah. chilling, leaning against a palm tree when our buddy Howie makes a bust for it. 
Yeah. Uh, and, uh, even the other patrons are like, Howard, you jellyfish, come back here. We need you. And he's just like, tough. And he goes booking. And then, of course, the yellow boots magically appear out of nowhere on Luke's feet as he strips off his Hawaiian shirt to well, throw on the yellow silk threads, giant they, chain belt, metal armbands. And tiara. And tiara. Well, they could have been there the whole time because we never actually see his lower body. We just see the top. Well, we do on that very first panel on the top. Of the right, page. but you can't make anything away. out. Yeah. Um, but I, I especially the top panel. I really like the art on this page, like because I think one of the reasons I like this issue as well is that it's not New York again. So I like seeing this vastly different locale and them sort of traveling. Mm-hmm. You know. A different place with different with different buildings. Like it's not a, you know, it's not like a big metropolis that they're in. It's, uh, I mean, I, don't, I can't remember where they are exactly, but all the building and architecture is different and stuff. And I don't know, like it's a nice change of pace for me because like a lot of this runs just in New York, and there's so many filler issues in this run as well that you kind of feel like you're just reading. But uh, anyway, so. Yeah, and I feel like they should have kept their, like, original clothes on for the whole issue instead of changing into their superhero outfits, because I think that would have been cooler. But, you know. Uh, So the the bar is, like... Danny busts out with a white and black mask to go with his outfit. That would have been awesome. Yeah. But uh, he's laid waste to the bar. Everyone's down. Everyone. Bar is trashed. Yeah. Um, so he just, he walks out into a phone booth to call the guy, the client who hired them. Looking like Mark Hamill. <laughs> I'll stick with the kind. But, uh, he, he does look, he does look uh, like Luke did in the Marvel comics. He does bear a striking resemblance to that. I will say. But, uh, anyway, so Luke's tailing him, trying to be conspicuous, which is why he changed into his garish superhero costume. <laughs> and he knows. how he's making for the docks. Yeah. So we got, like, this dude's name. Uh, so we, because we, we cut back to Danny talking, changing into his costume now. This guy's named after a burrito from Taco Bell. Yeah, like El Supremo? Really? No. Is that what you guys came up with? Like, and there's no letters page here, so I don't know what's going on. Um, it's <laughs> like, this This has to be tongue in cheek. Or they're them just, like, I, I, it's just, it weirds me out. Because they take the characters seriously in their character arcs, but then. There's all this goofy stuff happening as well. Like El Supremo, who's pretty pretty close to literally being a mustache twirling villain, um, mm. and you can tell he's going to be a bad guy immediately. Uh, <laughs> well, is well first the first panel we have um, Danny stripping out of his Saturday Night Live outfit. Yeah, with a, of course he's got the green and yellow underneath, and the colors just pop up. And uh, he's calling to speak with El Supremo Suite. Yeah. And then we have a picture of the hotel where El Supremo is hanging out. And I'm not positive on this, Mm -hmm. but it kind of looks like a certain hotel, a certain president named Richard Nixon. (laughs) Oh, Got in trouble for tapping some people's rooms. There's like, yeah, there's there has to be some weird level of self awareness going on, and like I don't know why it's taken this long to realize it unless I realized it before and we forgot because we haven't been on this for what like a year more than a year now. Mm-hmm. Um, man, it's so weird. Uh, still. Uh, I, I like it. 
So I like this issue anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. next so we think he's apparently staring, staying at the water gate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and there we have El Supremo in all his costuminess and badges and sashes and awards and. He looks like Oops. a really, like his hairstyle and everything looks like the very stereotypical dictator. Yes. Um, do we ever find out what country they're from? Oh wait, yeah, Terra yeah, so. Nueva, which I am like ninety nine percent sure is it's made up. <laughs> I'm gonna look that up before I say made up, so I don't know if I can be it. Um, you look it up and I'll say what's going on. So it's a company. Basically, so <laughs> it's new, so. <laughs> It's uh, he's all about stamping out this evil that is smuggling drugs from his country into the United States and using that money to pay for the, you know, the evil guys who are keeping his leadership down and hurting his country, and he is the most decorated hero in the history of his homeland. And whoever the woman is who's in the background is going yeah. and odd is too. It's Jane and Gray. And he's like, up. look, I got to catch up with Luke, but we'll call you back later once we know what's going on. And he's like, do that. If we succeed in this, I may even earn myself another medal. And his, he's covered in medals. Yeah. As he's smoking his cigarette in the cigarette holder. Yeah. So Danny runs off to meet up with Luke so they can both get Howard. I guess it was a backup plan to see who ran away from the bar. I don't know, whatever. Um, so, oh yeah, Danny comes from the ocean. <laughs> well, Danny's got a, tra he's got, uh, Luke's got a hell of a head start. And it yeah. says here how, because of his training in Kun Lun, he learned his discipline of sense, sight, and sound. So tracking Luke and Howard will be easy for him. And then Luke confronts Howard on the actual dock himself itself and he's saying you know you got nowhere left to run yeah and howard picks up a giant huge fish hook like for hooking a tuna or something i don't know who you are or why you're following me but if you come any closer i'll sink this hook into your gut and then danny emerges with the moon behind him on the other end of the dock dripping wet because obviously he swam out to get around him don't do that. You'll only make him mad if you try. Oh, no, not another one. Stop him. I'm getting out of here. As his, he hops into one of the boats and takes off. His call is going crazy here. <laughs> Just going to say. Um, but they... So... It's alive, Connor. It's alive. <laughs> he takes off in a boat. So then, Paramount and Arnfus, they get into a boat to chase him. Which, it's kind of funny that he hops into a boat starts it, and then his boats aren't, like, fast immediately, so he would have had to, like, slowly start <laughs> off. And they didn't, they just kind of stood there watching all that, I guess, <laughs> as he starts the boat. But, anyway, so, they start chasing after him, and then we get the electric jolt. Well, I liked how the artist bent back Danny's collar in the boat to represent that they're going fast. Yeah, that's an interesting detail. Um, not necessarily, because we already know it doesn't obey the laws of physics, but at least he tried, I guess. Uh, oh, for the jolt. Yeah. Welcome to a private hell. This is one woman's endless, inescapable nightmare. She is Colleen Wing, and she is being tormented. Body and mind, surrounded by those she loves. She most loves, sorry and those she hates and fears more than anything in the world. Master Khan, oldest of all living sorcerers, smiles as he orders his minions to attack her. Hassan, the slave master, hastens to obey. While David Anger, master of the force known as the Mindstorm, screams his songs of pain and madness. Colleen's friends, Iron Fist and Misty Knight, reach out to her. But they are powerless to help. And over and over again, she hears her beloved father cry out as if he were in unbearable agony. So, so, that, so that's a jolt. 
Yeah. It's a, it is a pretty cool page. Oh, no, artwork-wise. This is one of the... And it's done in the whole trippy style from when Anger first showed up and was doing his mind scream, calling, causing people to, like, hallucinate and everything, so... And this is, like... Even, even the artwork's a callback. This is the big arc in Iron Fist where everything sort of led up to from when he left Kumbon is they... This is Master Khan. I don't know, he was doing something. It, it's a bit... It's a bit hard to remember exactly, because it... I don't want to say it was convoluted, but, like... I can't remember if UT was working for Master Khan or not, or they ended up having a, a quibble with each other. But either way, I remember Master Khan and Anger abducted Colleen. Mm. And what was, wasn't their plan, like, to turn her into their weapon or yep. something? And I can't remember why they were doing it, though. Well, I think it was Master Khan was from Kun Lun, so he wanted revenge on Kun Lun in general. Yeah, I'm just trying to remember so, how, like, brainwashing Colleen helps with that. I think that had to do with killing Danny. All right. So, basically, we, we have another little non-full-page spread follow-up here where... Angar the Screamer with his mind storm attacked both of them. Because of her training, she survived but was abducted and then broke and turned into their slave, where her father, uh, Lee, I believe his first name is, was basically almost sent into a coma and was dying. And it was Danny's, you know, unstoppable force of using his chi to bring her father back to life that actually saved him from dying because Danny wouldn't allow her to lose her father like he lost his. But unfortunately, in all of this, um, she came out of it with the help of Danny in a mind meld that she basically held over his head for a couple of years. And... Um, but the father had not had the mental and physical training that she had. So the mind storm basically caused him to blank out everything that happened to the point where he didn't even remember that he had a daughter. Hmm. Because yeah. if he admitted he had a daughter, he was admitting what had happened in his mind. Or that's what they're getting at. And I, I feel like the last time we saw Professor Lee, or Professor Wing, whatever, he was in a hospital bed. So they never really wrapped that up, I believe. I Again, think you're if, right. Yep. If any listeners know, uh, let us know. Because, like, it's been ages since, not only has it been ages since we covered it, it's been ages since this happened in the comics as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and yeah, you were right. Uh, he, they kidnapped Colleen to brainwash parents killing Iron Fist, probably because he had a beef with Iron Fist and Kung Lun. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, you know, that... So that we have, yep. We have, we have Colleen awakening from her nightmare in her bedroom, uh, basically going on about, you know, Dad, don't say that I'm your daughter. Oh, yeah. This is the first time we've heard about uh, him not knowing that she was his daughter as well. Right. So, like, this... this yeah. Um, so but, she, she gets up and quickly gets dressed, saying that she's been having this nightmare for months, and that's why she asked if she could hang out with Luke and Danny on this adventure just to get her mind off of things. Apparently it's not working, so she decides to go out and get some fresh air to clear her head, and there's some Goomba. <laughs> yeah. With the gold chains and the shirt unbuttoned all the way down to his belt buckle, hanging outside with his cigarette going, say, I wonder where this little dolly's going. Because, you know, people apparently talk like that in 1981. No, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's taking a walk on the beach to clear her head, and where does she wind up? But her dad's new location, which is a small little cabana on the beach. Well, um, she does say uh, she tagged along with them so she could put an end to her nightmares once and for all. So I think she always meant to 
both of them. Oh yeah, she's definitely gonna come here. But as she says right there, she didn't plan on getting here this this early, showing up on the first day or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. She introduces herself. Uh, Mr. Wing thinks like she's one of his students, but he doesn't really recognize her. So he's offering her some tea, and uh, she says, "No, I'm not one of your students. I'm Colleen Wing, your daughter." He drops his cup of tea and basically begins to shut down, saying, I have no daughter. I can't have a daughter. If I yeah. did, that would mean that she was with me when, 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 and I felt, and I saw, and and I have no daughter. So he's basically like PSTS or whatever it is, going almost into shock and reverting to the coma he was in for months. And she's like, no, Dad, please stop. You know it's me. Oh, Dad. I go, God, I'm sorry. So sorry, Dad. Yeah, she... And she basically realized that this was kind of the wrong thing. And he's just like, Miss, are you okay? Because, again, his mind is completely twapped thanks to Angar. So, and meanwhile... Back to the boat chase. Yeah, so... A lot of things happen here. So they're chasing him and they're kind of like oh Luke weighs too Luke's like I kind of weigh too much and the other guy Howard he he's thinking his fuel's running low gotta get rid of them before they realize so he starts shooting at them and then Luke jumps on the boat uh and he asks Danny to take the wheel and Danny's trying to talk to Luke and then so Luke lands on the boat and Danny goes Luke we don't have any machines in Kumon I don't know how to drive this thing uh, which is funny, but I'm pretty sure we've had this conversation before because he drove a car and we were asking when he learned to drive a car, right? Or was that in the TV show? I think that was in the TV show actually, where we're like, "Hey, when do you learn to drive a car?" Yeah. I think that might have been in a TV show because I'm not remembering him behind the wheel of anything in an actual comic until this actual issue. Okay, maybe some of our super listeners can. Uh, did Danny drive a car before this point? I think you might be right, though. I don't think he has driven a car. So, um, so, so Luke's battling Howard on the boat, and and Danny's just like off in the <laughs> distance in every shot in the boat, going, going in, in the wrong direction. direction. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not joking. Every panel, if there's a background, you see the boat with like iron fist, a straight arm, and the steer wheel. Like, what do I do? Yeah. Um, so, of course, he shoots him more in the chest, and trying to get away from Luke, he actually backs up to the edge of the boat, and Luke smashes the controls of the boat, which causes the boat to decelerate, which causes Howard to fall into the water. And, of course, when you take a boat, you want to know how to swim, but apparently Howard can't. So Luke spot living in some, Florida. Luke throws some... <laughs> life preservers at Howard because this little tiny boat has like 19 life preservers in and the they back. keep sinking hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so finally he just gets the boat over and reaches over and pulls him in his Danny's like look out here we <laughs> go and Call Luke a, actually a has to um, <laughs> reach out the edge of the boat he's in and grab the other boat to stop Danny yeah so, at which point they're back at the dock calling El Supremo because they want some fire salsa with that. Wow. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're giving him the down low, and essentially his opponents have been sending, like, drug smugglers to meet with, like, leisure cruisers out at sea and then smuggle the drugs into America through that. I'm guessing, like, international water shining and stuff like that. And El Supremo's like, hey, can you bring your prisoner here before you phone the police, just so I can talk to him? Because this creates diplomatic problems, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, okay. Um, <laughs> so, now we cut to Colleen, um, who's managed to calm her father down, and then she leaves. And gets jumped. Yeah. Um, originally I thought it was the guy... Wait, was it the guy? No, I think it was. If not, he I looks think, awful similar. I, th I think it's supposed to be the guy who made the I wonder where Dolly's going comment, but he is wearing a completely different shirt. And he does he say knows, Dolly again. 
it's still unbuttoned down to his belt buckle, and he is wearing one last gold necklace. But I just think that's a continuity error. Yeah. And he says, sorry for the disturbance, taking him for questioning, so he appears to be a police officer. Um, and, and so they snatch Colleen away, and Dad is left puzzled about how odd she didn't seem like that type of person. Yeah. I wonder why El Suprema asked us to meet him here. Place looks deserted. <laughs> um, Birdhouse of the Pink Princess. That's his boat, I guess, his yacht or whatever. Um, so uh, the Pink Pink Princess was the name of the hotel. Oh, I see. Oh, it has a birdhouse. Wow, cool. Um, uh, it's on it's on the water in Florida. Yeah. So that's. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Um, so. Of course, uh, in this boathouse is nothing but evil. Yeah, and Colleen. So, El Supremo... So, the, the prisoner is like, El Supremo, no, you can't take me to him. And, you know, he'll do to me, and El Supremo goes, I'll soon find out. Supremo! Uh, and, and for some reason, he has Colleen. That's and, his leverage. Yeah. Getting what he wants. True, because he wants... Couldn't he just, like... I don't know. Whatever. Um, it's not too bad. Well, well, they're heroes. They would turn the bad guy over to the police and wouldn't let him torture yeah. him. Yeah. And that's basically what El Supremo actually wants to do, is he wants to torture Howard to find out the names of who actually is behind this drug-running heist. Not to save his country, because El Supremo actually wants to take it over to get the money from yeah. the drug running to make him un, an unstoppable force where he'll soon be able to basically take over his country. Yeah, and the art is definitely getting a lot worse. So. Uh, oh, funny. yeah. Um, and because of this... Fist fight! Yeah, um, and actually Professor Wing has... Followed. S- yeah, followed. And he's looking through the window and he's like, who's that boy in green? Why does he so, seem so familiar to me? So obviously, he was in... Um, uh, you know, him and Colleen were in, what was it, the third several issue? Issues, several issues of the original run. Oh, yeah, but uh, I meant they first popped up very early. I think they first popped up in the third issue. Yes, or after four. the whole, Building I'm not going to kill you for what yeah. you did to my father and I'm walking away, he bumps into Mr. Lee in issue three. So they're, they're, the, they're Iron Fist's first supporting characters outside of Kumlun. Because um, we don't see Scythe or whatever. Come back, unfortunately. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so blah blah. Evil speech. I want to take over the drugs. Um, and they're at the bottom of the ocean because float through the men. Because <laughs> all, obviously all the life life uh, what are it life preservers were yep. full of the drugs, which is why they were sinking. Um, and Luke, being Luke, destroyed all the drugs. Yeah. Um, so, Supremo actually has a brain in his head and knows that shooting Luke Cage is worthless because he's bulletproof. However, Danny, not so much. So we see him aiming for the back of Iron Fist as, the Iron, as Iron Fist is taking care of some of his other uniformed goons. And Luke catches yeah. wind of this and he's like, Fist, get down! And Danny ducks just in time as the bullet actually blows through his collar. And that it'll grow back. Ang- That's right, it'll heal. And yeah. that makes Luke angry. You lousy, ain't nothing in the world gonna stop me from taking you apart metal by metal. I actually really like that part. Like, <laughs> like Luke could probably just rip him apart if he wanted to. Like, a, well, did you, um, did, well, did you catch it? The silhouette in the background of the next panel? <laughs> wow <laughs> there's literally metals flying in the air above his head that's actually pretty funny um, guy. I really like that as, as Iron Fist is like heart of the dragon another two inches and I would have, wouldn't have a head left thanks Luke and then we have Mr. Wing outside the window again slowly having his memory come back to him I yeah. do know him. I translated the legend into English. 
the legend of the lost city of Kun Lung, and their warrior champion, Iron Fist. And Howard is doing what Howard does best, running for it. Yeah. Again. Yeah, so, like, three times he, like, runs away. I find it, it's definitely a running gag. And then Luke knocks him out with a... He intended to knock him out with a life preserver. He throws at him and hits him, but then all the drugs puff out. So I guess the drugs knock him out. <laughs> um, and, uh, and you know, Professor Wing is like... Iron Fist has kind of triggered uh, his memory coming back. Mm-hmm. He's a friend of mine, of my family. Oh, my head. <laughs> hey, head, her, flashback, recollection. These things go together quite well in yes. Iron Fist comics. Um. <laughs> and now Colleen, armed with only an oar because she didn't bring her sword on vacation with her, takes care of three of the goons from El Supremo. Honestly, and- what? I, I've always said this. I always thought the idea of Colleen just carrying around her katana was dumb, mm-hmm. like in New York. So I like it. I like that she's beating up dudes in the war because makes more sense. So, but anyway. But again, Mr. Mister Wing is watching all of this, and it's slowly sinking in, ever so slowly, as Colleen is kicking these guys' asses and using moves he helped teach her that she, in fact, is his daughter. And at the very last panel, as she dispatches the third guy, he recognizes her and knows she is Colleen. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah, because she got trained by her grandfather, who, like, looks pretty young. I know she's only a kid, but, like, he looks about the same age that Professor Wing would be. He's out of her. But, um... Dude, I literally know people who are grandparents at 32 years old. Wow. Do that math. Uh, I'd rather not. Um. <laughs> people getting busy at 16. Woo-hoo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> moving on. So... Uh, that's all wrapped up, essentially. Luke's taking care of his goons. Danny's taking care of his. El Supremo's laying on the floor. Yeah. Not a single medal left. That, going, what hit me? <laughs> I don't know how I didn't notice that, but that is awesome. <laughs> like, I don't know. As I'm, like, to be clear, I never disliked Luke Cage. But as I'm rereading these, I just... Every time I reread these, I like him more and more. So... Um, but, uh, yeah, and a, a nice reunion between Colleen and her dad, finally. Yes, dad remembers his daughter, and they have a loving embrace, finally. And Luke is like, nice way to wrap up a job, huh, Fist? And he's like, very nice. Uh, Luke, do they sell pizza in Florida? Now, is that a joke? Because is that like an American thing? Because I don't get it. Well, no, Luke, uh... New York, famous for pizza. Ah, uh, okay. Now they're, in, now they're in Florida. Don't they have sure pizza they, everywhere? There is pizza everywhere, but again, you're probably going to get pineapples on it in Florida. No, just kidding. Anybody who lives in Florida, they sell normal pizza in Florida, but I think that's just a running gag because okay. Danny does love pizza. He's mentioned it several times. But next, the mountain comes to Manhattan. Oh, good Lord. Dear listeners, you've heard me mention the Mountaineer a lot, and that means I got mixed up (laughs) with the Mountain. Uh, This is, like, my benchmark for the worst villains ever. Um, Like, I absolutely loathe the Mountain. He is awful. He is woeful. So that's going to be fun to talk about when it comes. And it has to be a joke. No one can come up with a villain that bad, seriously. Except maybe Stan Lee. But... Like, hey, hey, do you remember Water in Daredevil? He was terrible. Um, I I read early Daredevil. Okay, you had the Matador and uh, Leapfrog, or whatever. I'm sorry, Stan, but those guys sucked. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, actually, good issue. Uh, very silly, but like, um. You know, it had, like, the serious subplot with Colleen and her dad. Mm -hmm. And the artwork, even though, like, 
uh, in comparison to the start of the issue, it like went a bit weak at the end. It was still good throughout. I really liked the aesthetic of Florida, like the different clothes, everyone, even like different clothes Colleen was wearing. Um, and, you know, just fighting on a pier and stuff. I mean, it was a very nice change from New York City. Because I'm like, um, I think New York's cool, but for Pam and Iron Fist, like, it, it works, but I don't know. It just seems very... They don't utilise the setting that much, but I don't know if that's just me. But maybe it's just because a lot of the stories are kind of forgettable because they're always trying to find, like, um, you know, like the last issue with that mercenary revenge scheme or that, that smelter guy with the flamethrower. I can't even remember his name. Um, but anyway, yeah, this issue stood out because stuff actually happened and different location. I liked it. So, yeah, what do you think? Oh, I definitely give it a thumbs up. It was a good, fun yeah. issue. It wasn't too heavy. Uh, we have the cleaning up of a storyline, which is always a bonus. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Wings in the picture, that's been resolved. So that's good. And it was just fun. There's a lot of cool, funny, goofy comments, a lot of funny pictures, like the uh, Danny with the boat in the background, yeah. ripping the medals off the guy. Just It was just a good issue. I yeah. mean, it was nothing, it's not going to win any awards, but it no. was just good and it was fun. Yeah, it was, it was a strong issue. Um, and it's a good issue to leave. Uh, it's a good issue to end on for the Epic Collection as well. Yes. Um, so, yeah. I wish there was like less forgettable issues and just more issues like this. Even though, as you said, this doesn't win any awards. This is like... Like, you know, classic Power Man and Iron Fist. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this showcases like all the stuff it does really well. Um, not that this sums up everything, because I do... Like, the Kumon stuff is really good as well, but... Yeah, and that plot thread, wow. Because I just... I'm trying to think back. Colleen hasn't really gotten much to do. Like, she's been around, but the... You know, she hasn't really been a big plot point or anything like the Anger, the Screamer, and Master Khan stuff. Ever since that, she hasn't had much development, I guess. She, like, flirted with Bob Diamond. And she works sure. with Misty. That's pretty much all she's really done. So it's nice that she gets a moment to wrap up the plot line of hers and stuff. Because I do like Colleen. Uh, not really in the show, but I do like her here. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. So, well, we got... Not that we were doing this by Epic Collection, but I guess that's, like, the kind of benchmark we've reached, right? So, I guess I'll be popping... The Heroes for Hire collection back on the shelf, and I'll not be going. Not that we need to mention it, but this is all everything we've covered so far for from Power Man and Iron Fist in these podcasts has yeah. all been in Volume One of the Epic Collection in color, no ads. Yeah, they fully reproduced. Not that the ads aren't funny sometimes. Yeah, and it's called cool Heroes for Hire. The believe, believe. Well, it's called Power Man and Iron Fist here. Here's for hire. Yeah, well, that, that's what I mean. Like the, it's Power Man and Iron Fist Epic Collection, but then the subtitle is like Here's for Hire. Uh, 1977 to 1981, 39.99 in U.S. currency. I believe it is still available. And as we discussed earlier in another podcast, I believe Volume Three just hit. Or is yes. It uh, no, Volume Three because I got it. Remember, I uh, Doombringer. Um, but there, there will be a Volume Four, and that'll oh. definitely be out by the time we're up to it. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and the next volume is Volume Two. Uh, the subtitle is Revenge. So uh, there's some like good stuff. I haven't actually read through Volume Two yet. I mean, I've read it before, but not in that format. So I'm looking forward to that. There's a uh, the Jade Tiger stuff is coming up soon, which is cool. Uh, unfortunately, we have the Mountaineer, or the Mountain next, who's awful. I hate him. Um, but, you know, yeah. So... Actually, before we sign off, I would like to vent on one thing, and it's not, it does not have to do with this issue. It's just something I found a little funny. Fair enough. And it has to do with Finn Jones. Okay. All right, Finn Jones is, like, the only person right now from 
the Marvel series of Netflix shows that isn't working in some way or another, that I know of anyways. He might be back on doing Broadway shows or something. But he was set to play the lead character in the television show The Prodigal Son. I yeah. heard about this, heard he literally lost his job after the first table reading with everyone involved. So I'm just like, well, that's kind of odd. Well, my wife watched the whole show, said it was good. I really didn't care. Yeah. But then I heard that season two is actually going to happen. So I'm just like, all right, maybe I'll watch it. So I decided to watch it. Mm -hmm. Now, they replaced Finn Jones with Tom Payne who apparently had a role in The Walking Dead as some character. I stopped watching that after season three because it just became repetitive garbage. But anyways. I agree. <laughs> so I've watched every single episode of season one of The Prodigal Son. There's only like 12 of them. Yeah. It's a good, it is a good show. It is interesting. I'm not going to lie. Michael Sheen steals the show as the serial killer father who's locked away and they keep having to come to him, almost like a Hannibal Lecter type of deal from Silence of the Lambs. It's almost got that little twist to it, except now it actually involves other family members. Yeah. Tom, Tom Payne, who replaced Finn Jones, is literally doing a Finn Jones impersonation for all these issues, all these episodes. Really? It's like literally, if you shut your eyes... While the episode was on, and just listen to his voice, his speech pattern, and his canter, you'd be just like, is that Finn Jones doing Danny Rand? That, that's all I can see in here. I'm, I'm just like, so what did Finn Jones do at this table read that he immediately lost his job, and the higher-ups went, well, we kind of liked his whole feel. Go find the best person that basically is his clone. I just assume that he got the boot because of uh, the reception to him in Iron Fist. Um, I don't know, because that was months later that this was even discussed. Yeah, but maybe the higher-ups like freaked out when they googled Finn Jones and like, oh, he was in that bad Iron Fist show. You know what suits are like. But uh, that's just my assumption. I have no idea what actually happened. That's interesting, though. Uh, I haven't seen Prodigal Son, so I can't speak to that. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is good. It's worth a watch. But again, just watch. Listeners, if you've watched the show, tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me if you don't see it. Yeah, give us... Because I could be. I could be tainted because of the iron fist that's rammed in one ear and out the other on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. Am I, am I seeing iron fist and hearing him everywhere? Yeah. Look, get back to us on that because I'd be interested to know as well. Um, also, if you guys, so, like, I'm trying to get onto Podcast Garden about, because I haven't been able to display data on, like, our, like, listener usage, well, our, our downloads and stuff, I haven't been able to display it because Podcast Garden just, it hasn't worked on there for ages, I emailed them, like, a month ago. Again, another reason I want to upgrade to Lipson, please go to our Patreon. <laughs> um, but... So, if anyone knows how I can check, like, how many listens I'm getting through directly through, like, the RSS feed or something, hit us up. Otherwise, um, you know, the, the, my, my point is going to be is we did get most votes for Power Man and Iron Fist, and we're happy to keep covering that. Uh, as, as we said, when we get to an arc, we'll do the whole arc in one episode, and it won't probably be, won't be like as detailed as this issue, for instance, but we will cover the whole arc. Um, but if you guys... If new stuff does pop up, we'll be splintering off to cover the new stuff so we can keep it current. Yeah. Um, but my question was, did everyone want us to switch to a different run and come back to this later? We just want us to keep going with Power Man and Iron Fist. I'd really appreciate feedback on this because otherwise we'll just keep doing Power Man and Iron Fist because we're fine doing it. It's fun. Um, but we have, we, we've been doing Power Man and Iron Fist like almost, that's all we've been doing for like a year. 
um, outside of like Contagion. So I don't know what you guys think. Uh, we also have the Heroes for Hire request from Phil. Which so we'll be getting to. We will be getting to that. We're just still trying to work out how we're working it in. But like, yeah, if you guys are fine with us to continue doing Pan Man and Iron Fist and then switching to any new releases, that's fine. Or if we have like an overwhelming response to do Immortal Iron Fist, we're happy to switch to that. You know, like, we'll, we'll finish all the runs. Like, this, if we do, if you guys do want us to take a detour and cover another run, we'll still come back and finish this run later. In fact, as you said, it's like, you know, we did just finish one epic collection. But uh, up to you guys. If you guys have any feelings, get back to us. Otherwise, we're just going to keep doing this. And if you want us to keep doing this, let us know as well. Um, so, yeah. Um, until, but, yeah. That being said, that's that's all the stuff that we have to say, so uh, you ready to wrap up? Oh yeah. Okay, so, until next time, uh, don't trust anyone called El Supremo that like, seems or, really or, evil. Or, or anything named after something on Taco Bell's menu. Right. Uh, yeah, okay. Peace. Next time, the mountain. Later. Uh. <laughs>